And now we're at 12 noon. Let's get started. Hello, welcome to our monthly Science Talks webinar. My name is Lindsay Shula, Assistant Director of Development in the Faculty of Science. We acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. The presentation today, Electric Potential, is about 30 minutes in length, followed by a question period. We will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. Please type your question into the Q&A box, which will appear at the top or bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, these questions will be shared with the presenter to address. A video box of the presenter will appear. If it happens to obscure the presentation material, you can move it by clicking and dragging it to another area of your screen. It is now my pleasure to introduce Frederick West, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Science. Thank you, Lindsay. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us for this month's Science Talks webinar. It's so great to have the opportunity to connect with you all. So I just have one little update for everyone. Uh, and that is that earlier today, we celebrated the graduating class of fall 2021 at a virtual convocation ceremony. And I want you to please join me in congratulating the Faculty of Science graduates and welcome, welcoming, welcoming them to our dynamic and remarkable alumni family. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Daniel Alessi. Let me tell you a little bit about him. So Dan's an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. And he specializes in environmental geochemistry and geomicrobiology. Since 2013, his research group has focused on understanding the surface chemistry and reactivity of environmental materials such as iron oxides, bacteria, and biochar on lithium extraction from oil field brines and on improving our knowledge of the water cycle in unconventional oil and gas operations. Dan currently holds the Encana Chair in Water Resources at the University of Alberta and he won the 2020-2021 Faculty of Science Research Award. He sits on the editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals, including Marine and Petroleum Geology, ACS Earth and Space Chemistry, Geobiology, Environmental Geochemistry and Health, Critical Reviews in Environmental Science and Technology, and Chemical Geology. Wow, what a list. Well, I'm really looking forward to this talk. So I'm going to hand it over now to our speaker. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Fred, for the kind invitation uh, to, to give this seminar. I really appreciate it. And uh, I would reiterate uh, Dr. West's um, comment on thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time and, and the diversity of people that's coming to this from, from different locations. So I guess one question I didn't ask is, do I have control of the slide deck? <laughs> Don, am I able to change the slides or do I request that you move them? Um, Lisa will double check that for you, Dan. Uh, thank you for your patience and everybody else too. Lisa, has that been activated? Um, the slide deck that I have is, is just the standard deck. Dan should be able to share his screen for his own slides. Oh, I see this. I thought my slides might have been in here. That sounds good. Um, okay, then I will do that. And take your time. We're, do we're doing quite well here. It's only 1204. Great, so that's, uh, that's successful? Yes, it looks great. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Okay, so today I'm going to try to give a fairly succinct talk about the extraction of lithium focused primarily on the technology side, which um, in my perception is one of the major kinks to going to commercial production here in Alberta and also in other jurisdictions around the world. And I will provide some context up front about conventional mining. Um, and at the end, I'll go into a little bit of an example of an economic analysis 
and some comments about perhaps the types of things that the province can do to incentivize or move forward a lithium industry uh, in the province. So the driver for lithium, if you don't know it, is it's this projected massive growth in the need for batteries materials. And one of the major uh, metals that goes into batteries is lithium, particularly in renewable energy, where we're interested in developing uh, lithium, a lithium ion battery industry. So these show some of the projections on the, on the left here. You can see the uh, we're at 2021 20, right now, um, headed towards 2030. And there's uh, potentially, depending on who you talk to, there's a five to 10 fold growth in storage need, which translates directly into the need for more lithium uh, to supply the, the raw material to produce these batteries. Again, here you see in the right different elements that go into batteries. Um, lithium is one of the big ones, and, and this is specific to electric vehicles, but we're seeing uh, a ninefold increase in demand for lithium projected out to 2030. So the issue here that we face is that the conventional sources that I'll present here in a bit simply are not going to be able to keep pace with this demand over the next five to 10 years. So it's predicted around 2025, 2026, we're simply going to be short on lithium. Um, now, while there are conventional sources coming online, um, we really do need alternative sources in the, mid, uh, the, the short to midterm in order to, to fill this gap. So I'll, just a little bit of a general topic here, which metals are potential targets and brines? Here's a, on the left-hand side, an analysis of a typical brine in Alberta. It's from the Duvernay Formation. And so what you see it was one of the issues we're dealing with in this resource. It's got a ton of sodium and chloride, so 136,000 ppm chloride, 70,000 ppm sodium. So that's about 200,000. Keep in mind the oceans, the salinity of the oceans are around 35,000 ppm. So here we're looking at a brine that has a salinity that's in the order of five to 10 times that of seawater. And the thing we're shooting for, right, is lithium in this case. So lithium in this particular brine is at about 55 parts per million. So this really is a, a traditional needle in the haystack problem, where if we're going to make an industry out of this, we have to have a highly selective technology, which strips out the lithium while leaving all this other stuff that we don't want behind. I am, I'm not going to talk about it at all today, but cobalt's also a potential target. This is used in batteries and it's quite valuable. One issue with cobalt is that it's primarily sourced from about 70% comes from the Congo. And there's basically artisanal mines there that don't have good safety practices. So in terms of, um, well, in terms of having a, a, a safe and reliable source, it's another potential metal that, that would be on the list. Uh, boron I mentioned as well, that's also in the brine and it, it can be used in hydrogen storage. But what you see here back to lithium, is that lithium is used in the anode side of the, the battery along with the carbon, the graphite, for example, that makes up the anode. It stabilizes, uh, uh, it prevent, prevents oxidation of the anode, and it also helps with recharging the battery. Lithium moves across between the anode and cathode, so it's in the, the solvent that's between the anode and cathode, and it also makes up part of, it makes up part of the solid phase material that's in the cathode. So it's used really in all the parts of the batteries, and it's a major component. So onto the mining part, a little more background, that's batteries. Here's the conventional lithium sources, and there's two. Um, so the first one is what are called solars. So these are essentially salt flats. Um, you might be familiar, for example, with the Bonneville salt flat in Utah. So you can walk out onto that, but beneath the surface, as you get into the below the groundwater table, it turns into a brine. So there's groundwater underneath uh, these solars, and the salt readily dissolves into that into that uh, groundwater. So what we do in places like South America, so the lithium triangle is the biggest uh, solar producer of lithium. So this is at the boundaries between Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, um, is you pump the brine up from fairly shallow depths and it's put into evaporation ponds. So you can imagine pumping out a lot of water. It sits in an evaporation pond that can be anywhere from many months up to even approaching two years. And you evaporate out the water, and it ends up that lithium is one of the last things to precipitate out of the water, right? As you, as you know, as you, as you evaporate water, salts start to precipitate eventually. So you can optimize this process where you evaporate it, remove the stuff that you don't want, and then that water that has more concentrated lithium is moved into subsequent ponds for further purification. 
Um, the issue with this is that evaporation process is fairly inefficient. So you end up recovering maybe 50 or 60% of the lithium. I mentioned it takes a long time. Um, it wouldn't work here in Alberta. I mean, uh, obviously the climate is not <laughs> as, uh, as sunny as it is in, in uh, say Bolivia, Chile and Argentina. And it also has a, a big environmental impact. And the primary one there is water. So you can imagine as you're pumping this water out of the middle of a solar, that water needs to be replaced and it's replaced at the margins of the solar. So essentially you're taking fresh water, which is used in the case of South America by the communities that exist around these solars. It's pulled into the area of the solar and it's contaminated. And so it's very uh, water intensive, um, something around 2000 cubic meters of water per ton of lithium that you produce, so quite, quite water intensive. Um, the other one, uh, traditional source is hard rock from what are called granitic pegmatites. So this is a type of igneous rock. Um, and these have higher concentrations than are in the solars. So the solars are around many hundreds to a few thousand parts per million. Highest concentrations of lithium. You find them in Western Australia is the biggest place. Also in China, Mozambique, there's other places. But the point here is you have a traditional open pit surface mine. Um, that comes with all the issues that you would imagine with an open pit mine. So surface perturbation, uh, the generation of quite a bit of CO2 by running machinery. Um, about half of the cost in energy input is into actually crushing the rocks and processing them to do the lithium extraction. And in both of these cases, what I wanted to point out, I'm going to talk about it in this talk, the two salts that go into uh, lithium battery production are lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide. So those are the two, two targets. So for example, Tesla uses lithium hydroxide to make their electric vehicle batteries. And so these are the products that you need to produce. And typically you need to produce them at 99 plus percent purity. Now, focusing on the province here just briefly, um, there's an estimate that there are many millions of tons of lithium in Canada. We often talk about this in terms of lithium carbonate. So it's called lithium carbonate equivalent. Um, it's tough to get estimates because of course all this brine's underground and resources are being expo explored, but we're looking at something that's probably easily over 10 million tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. Um, keeping in mind, I checked today, and if I'm not mistaken, the price of lithium carbonate, it's all over the place, but today it ends up being high. It's around 25,000 US dollars per ton. Um, so I'll get to this at the end, but you're talking about you know, money that's in the, in the hundreds of billions potentially. Uh, we look, if you look at this map, Eccles and Berhane published this nice report, and you can see a map of lithium uh, in the subsurface, and uh, in a lot of it's in the Leduc Reservoir. Um, but you can see hot spots, and so those are areas that may be in Alberta over 100 parts per million. Those are areas that you would target, um, obviously, because there's more lithium per unit uh, brine. Um, and the nice thing is that this area where we see the concentrated lithium is also an area of oil and gas production. So there's the idea that instead of having all the upfront capital expenditures of drilling new wells, um, we can lean perhaps in some cases on existing oil and gas infrastructure, including hydraulically fractured wells um, to recover this water using that infrastructure, um, borrow the water essentially that's already being produced as a waste, recover the lithium, and then send the brine back on its way for disposal. So in terms of being green, um, you know, there is some environmental impact to the oil and gas industry, but the infrastructure is already in place. So this could be a really quite green source of lithium here in the province. And that's part of the, uh, despite the relatively low concentrations, you know, I'm showing you it only goes up to maybe 140 ppm. It is a low grade resource, but there's a lot of it and it might be a much greener source of lithium. And that's generated obviously a lot of energy around this idea. So, uh, just I don't want to go too much into the geology because um, I'm focused more on the on the upstream extraction part, but we do have, uh, for example, around Fox Creek, we have a lithium an anomaly. And I just wanted to mention that there's a lot of people working on this. The primary school of thought at the moment is that this is driven by geothermal fluids. So we have faults in the basement here that extend down tens of kilometers. Um, the rock is relatively hotter. It ends up around Fox Creek, and this drives the convection, the movement of hydrothermal fluids. And those fluids uh, get closer to the surface, again, into places like the Leduc Reef. They carry lithium from these igneous rocks um, through. These are actually uh, siliciclastic units here, but it carries lithium up into relatively shallower areas. And so the thought is it's this sort of geothermal activity that drives the lithium anomalies uh, that we see. And those would be targets, of course, then for extraction. 
So now into what I'm really an expert in is the direct lithium extraction technology. So the first thing to say is that there are a lot of options in the literature uh, for extracting lithium. And we explored these um, when we started uh, working on this problem about four years ago. So those include solvent extraction with organic solvents. Some of them are toxic. Um, we didn't see that as being very promising. Uh, there's people working on membranes and they're highly uh, certain membranes are highly selective towards recovering lithium. The issue there is cost. Um, so it, depending on the brine, they can be economic, but uh, for Alberta petrobrines, membranes are not, I would say, a favored technology at the moment. There's electrochemistry. Um, so electrolysis is an example. So this is used, for example, to produce lithium hydroxide. Solar evaporation, we already talked about. Um, that's clearly not feasible in uh, Canada. And what we're going to focus on here here is called selective adsorption. So this is, you may have seen this phrase before, DLE, direct lithium extraction. These are materials that are highly selective towards recovering lithium from solution. It ends up by, the, the mechanism is by what's called ion exchange. Um, and so just to review the process uh, in sort of the four boxes that people always talk about, again, you've got a source of water from petroleum brines from operating wells or there are uh, operators in Saskatchewan, Alberta that are thinking of drilling their own sets of wells into areas that have high lithium concentrations. But regardless, you, you draw up this brine from a few kilometers below the surface. It would go into the direct lithium extraction process, so the lithium plant, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. But again, there you're recovering that dusting of lithium. All the rest of the brine goes back on its way, either back for disposal or reuse by the oil and gas industry or it's deep well injected uh, somewhere on site if you're drilling your own wells. Um, that fluid then, which I'll explain in a bit, is gonna be enriched in lithium. It's gonna be almost a fairly pure lithium solution at higher concentration. We would do some cleanup to remove any remaining impurities. If you're producing lithium hydroxide, it might undergo uh, electrolysis. But the point is from this, you precipitate out in here in between these two boxes, the lithium carbonate or the lithium hydroxide at battery grade and then this would get shipped off to battery man manufacturers to produce the product, which would ult ultimately go to market. So that's, that's the whole story. And this here, again, is really the kink at the moment in terms of the in industry, I would argue. This and also figuring out the supply chain, which I won't talk about a lot about today, but those are where some of the uncertainties are. So now we're, I'm going to get, uh, since this is a science talk, I, I'm going to do a, a, the technical portion of this just to put some meat on the bones. And this is a real study that was carried out by uh, Adam Seip, one of my former master's students who now is working out in uh, Vancouver, and by Salman Safari, who's uh, co-founded a company with me for lithium extraction. And this is a great project. We had a, a brine here, uh, just is very typical. So it's about 180,000 parts per million. Again, it's looking at something around six times the salinity of the ocean. This one didn't have great lithium concentrations, but that's okay for a testing hypothesis. It's around 40 parts per million lithium. And again, it's got a bunch of other stuff in it. Sodium, I guess chloride's not on here, but it's you know primarily sodium and chloride. So you're looking at lithium making up less than 0.06% of the cations in the solution, just a dusting of lithium. There are, in these ion exchange materials, these DLE materials, there are a lot of options and they tend to be metal oxide minerals. So it's titanium dioxide, manganese oxides, um, even uh, relatively, uh, I would say, exotic metals like antimony uh, have been tested. But among the most promising out there, if you start looking at patents uh, of companies, are these what are called spinel lithium manganese oxide nanoparticles. And this is uh, what we worked on for a few years. So they can contain two valent states of manganese, manganese 3 and manganese 4. Manganese 4 is the most oxidized version of manganese. So if I made an analogy in, in iron, right? So if you have a car, it's made out of zero valent iron. So iron metal is Fe0. The oxidized form of that when you have rust is iron three. And so this manganese four is the analogy to that. It's the completely oxidized, stable in the presence of, of oxygen form of manganese. And what you do is you precipitate this type of mineral, spinel lithium manganese oxide in the presence of lithium. So this is the mineral here. And when you do that, lithium incorporates into the structure and it ends up that when you precipitate it this way, it makes this, this site where lithium is existing in the structure of the mineral, this site is very precisely the size of lithium. Now lithium is relatively small. So in, there are 
a lot of things, actually there's many elements that are smaller than lithium, but it ends up that in terms of ions and solution in a brine, there's really only two things that can fit into those sites. And that's lithium, of course, because you precipitated that. And there's always protons H plus in water. That's the acidity, right? That's where pH comes from. So water H2O is always dissociating, it's separating into H plus and OH minus, even in a, a glass of water. And, but you can leverage this, right? So you can imagine the way that this works. I make this mineral, it's nanoparticulate. I might make it, I might bind it together into bigger particles depending on, on the application, but I simply put this material into the brine, which is a mess, right? It's just got this 50, 40, 50, 60, 70 PPM lithium. But because this material is highly selective, things like manganese, sodium, potassium, all these other cations simply cannot get into the structure. And so the only thing that can fit in there when it's in the brine is the lithium. So I load it up with lithium. Once that's done, so keep in mind, I've got a big volume of brine, a relatively small amount of, of this manganese oxide nanoparticles or bound particles in the solution. Once that process happens, it might take a half an hour, an hour or so, but then I void the rest of the, the lithium voided brine is sent away for disposal. And I've got this powder that's taking up, well now it's wet, but it's taking up a lot less space. I would add a little bit of acid, um, relatively weak acid it ends up, and that's called the protonation step. And so what happens then is the protons, the H plus, kick the lithium back out into solution. And because the volume of the acid that I added is far less than the initial brine volume, the concentration of lithium in the resulting solution is way higher. So for example, you might go from what we see here, 40 parts per million lithium in the brine to 1,500 parts per, per million in the concentrate. And the other great thing that I'll show you here in a bit is of course, you've excluded the majority of these things you don't want, sodium, magnesium, potassium, all those other things that we do from the brine. Um, and that's in a nutshell is what these DLE technologies, direct lithium technologies are about. This is just one example of the material. Uh, good, I think that covers the slide, so we can move on. Um, so with that background in DLE, we um, wanted to optimize this particular material uh, at the bench top. So we're, you know, we're doing laboratory research here, uh, the sort of fundamental research um, for lithium recovery from, in this case, we were studying a produced water from a hydraulically fractured well, but it could be any brine really, um, even a non-petroleum brine. And to do that, we uh, conducted repeated lithium absorption and desorption cycles. In other words, we reused that material I talked about many times. So it's often cited that if you're gonna have an economic plant in Alberta or generally, you're looking at having to, to, to be able to reuse this material 100, 150, 200 times in order to make the process economic because the costs of manufacturing these materials are a significant fraction of the total uh, cost of a plant. And in particular, since this was scientific, we wanted to understand the factors that control both the lithium recovery and the durability of the sorbent. So the experimental, just one quick one on kind of how the experiments go. You understand the process now, but these are the details. So again, we have a petroleum brine. This is a real field collected brine. It's cloudy. It's got minerals in there, um, precipitates. They tend to be iron silica oxides that uh, just from experience in the hydraulic fracturing world. So you don't want those in your process because they're going to clog things up. There's actually free product. So I think this is condensate, but there's some hydrocarbons floating on the top. So the first thing we do is centrifuge it, and you can see it's much clearer here, just to remove the solids, because we don't want those going into our, our uh, DLE material and messing things up. Uh, then we also physically remove the oil from the top, and we were left with a fairly pure solution. The a pH is adjusted, um, and the reason for that is we there's a, a pH, depends on the brine, but there's optim, optimal pH at which the DLE sorbent recovers lithium from the brine. So um, we did experiments across a broad range of pHs, but I'm, I'll show you the optimal pH, pH here in a bit, but essentially we adjusted to that pH. At that point, we have the sort of purified pH adjusted brine. We add the manganese oxide, it's a black powder, and that's the step where lithium again is being drawn from the brine into the, into the sorbent itself, into the ion exchange sites, and it's filling up the sites inside the material. Again, so this could take anywhere from 15 minutes to perhaps an hour, depending on the temperature. Um, we do another centrifugation step to remove the lithium. Now it's the lithium loaded uh, sorbent. And so what we have on top here is the waste brine. This is the lithium voided brine. So in an industry, this would go off for disposal. Here we pour it off into a waste container and we're done with it, right? 
And so all the lithium that was in this large volume is now concentrated into this little bit of powder. And you can see we put that into a vial again, we add just a little bit of acid so that when the lithium desorbs, we go from the 40 ppm lithium up to over a thousand parts per million lithium. Centrifuge again to recover the lithium voided sorbent because we wanna dry it and we're gonna kick it back into the cycle and reuse it a hundred times, right? Um, but what we have here is a far smaller volume in which lithium is concentrated. And that's the stuff that we would send off for post-processing. We would clean it up to remove other impurities that didn't quite make it past the sorbent. Um, and ultimately we would produce the, the battery grade salts from that. So here's some real data on that particular brine. I, I promise to show some conditions. So it ended up at pH eight and 70 degrees Celsius who were pretty good. 70 is uh, an important number because it ends up a lot of brines return to the surface in Alberta. By the time they get to the surface, they're between 60 and 80 Celsius. And so um, this is potentially feasible at an actual site. Two grams of the sorbent per liter of fluid. So it's quite a small mass of sorbent per volume of brine. Took about 30 minutes here to reach equilibrium to load up the sorbent with the lithium. The desorption step where you're kicking lithium back out of the sorbent is pretty fast. So it's actually less than five minutes, but five minutes gets you nearly everything. And this is the chemistry then of the desorption acid, the concentrate that we had. So you can see lots of lithium. Yes, some of the impurities were carried along. So boron, sodium, magnesium, calcium, uh, potassium, a little bit of strontium. Um, but keep in mind, sodium was originally present at thousands of times more than lithium. So we, this is super, super selective. The selectivity factor is many thousands. Um, and we still want to get rid of this because we're not going to produce 99% uh, grade battery salts from this. But the issue here is manganese. This comes not from the brine, but it comes from, remember, the sorbent itself, the DLE material is made from manganese. And what this shows you is that somehow in this material, manganese is being lost. And that's not good because again, you wanna reuse this thing a hundred times. Well, you don't want the sorbent itself being uh, chemically uh, dissolved essentially, right? So recovery is always over 80%. Typically really we see 90 to 95% recovery, sometimes even approaching hundred percent. And again, we've reduced 99, actually 99.9% .9 of the other cations in solution. So the problem to solve here is the manganese issue because that indicates loss or dissolution of the sorbent. So a couple problems here. I'm going to come back to that dissolution of the manganese. But what we did observe when we put the sorbent, the powder, into the brine, even after the centrifugation to remove the particles, even after pouring off the hydrocarbons at the top, is that the sorbent sometimes would not disperse in the solution. It wouldn't sort of distribute itself in the solution. It would float on the top. And the issue here, our hypothesis was that there were still non-aqueous uh, liquids in there, so hydrocarbons essentially, that were forming a coating on the sorbent and basically blocking its surface. And we can see that if we look at the data. So the dark gray uh, bars here, this is cycle testing. So we'll, this is the first extraction. And then remember, I said we're going to kick it back into the cycle. So we use it a second time, a third time, fourth and fifth, just to see, at least initially in the first five cycles, what was going on. And what you see if there's no treatment of the brine, besides again, the centrifugation of pouring off the hydrocarbons, is that, yeah, you get good recovery in the first cycle, that's about 17 milligrams per gram in this case, but it's radically reduced in the second and third cycle. Basically, you're, it's not useful anymore after the fourth or fifth cycle. So say, okay, that's a problem. What are we gonna do about it? Um, a simple idea would be just to centrifuge this at very high speed and see if we can, you know, some of the hydrocarbon molecules are relatively large. So perhaps we can centrifuge it at a higher speed and get better recovery. And that's what the middle bars here are showing. So again, we get about the same recovery in the first step and it still is declining significantly, right? By the time you get to the five, it's improved, but by the time you get to the fifth cycle, it's not really an economic sorbent anymore. So what we did to test the organics hypothesis ultimately, and you can see we had success here, is washing it with a surfactant. So this is a detergent, essentially, it's a soap. Um, the one we use is called Triton, it's an industrial uh, uh, surfactant. And again, you get the same recovery in the first one, 16, 17. It does decrease in the second cycle down to 13. But again, if we wash between every single step, every one of these cycles we did a wash, you stabilize your recovery around 13 milligrams per gram. So the story here, the, the message here is that if you have a petroleum brine that has significant organics in it, you're going to need a washing step between cycles in order to keep the uh, DLE material 
uh, effective at recovering lithium. Some other data as well, lithium uptake. Now here we're gonna compare the real brine, that's the real fluid that we've been talking about all, all along with the 40 parts per million with the synthetic fluid. And the synthetic fluid is just a brine made up in the lab. It has sodium and chloride at the same 180,000 parts per million total salinity. And we just spike it with the 40 parts per million lithium. So it's a super simple, doesn't have any organics, none of that kind of stuff. It's just the same salinity and it has the same concentration of lithium. The real fluid is much more complex, right? It has a lot of ions in it, a lot of organic compounds. And what we see here is there's a difference in lithium uptake. So we get about 18 in the synthetic fluid, less in the uh, real fluid, but not a dramatic loss. But what is, dramatic is, what is dramatic is the loss of sorbent. In other words, percent mass loss of the DLE material. In the synthetic fluid, we're looking at less than a percent. And in this particular brine, it varies very much depending on the brine you're testing. But in this particular brine, we were losing 9% of the sorbent mass in the first cycle. Uh, so what that means is the sorbent's basically gone after 10 cycles. Again, keeping in your mind that we're trying to aim for 100 cycles at least major problem in applying this technology to petroleum brines, right? Especially ones that have uh, organics in them like this. So it's an issue that we needed to solve. Before that, we wanted to, so, well, first we wanted to investigate at which step this manganese loss was happening, right? So we have the initial dry sorbent that's sitting out on the bench. We put it in the brine, it's reacting with the brine. And then after that, we put it into an acid, and that's the lithium desorption step. And that's what you see here. So we have a protonated sorbent. That's the sorbent in its initial condition before it sees the brine. Uh, lithium loaded, that's when it's in the brine and it's being loaded up with lithium. Lithium desorbed, that's when it's exposed to the acid and the lithium's kicked back out into solution. And I'm not going to talk about this one, but this sorbent here, remember I, I said um, manganese four sorbents work really well. So what this is plotted against is what's called the manganese average oxidation state. And you can see this particular sorbent here, the green dot here, um, is one that we were highly successful at getting almost all manganese four into the structure. But what's interesting is when you look at the uh, manganese valence state, the charge in the brine itself, when it's being lithium loaded, this is in the solid material itself, it declines. It goes from four down to uh, 3.75. And so what that's telling you naturally is that some of the manganese four must be converted into manganese three, or it ends up manganese two as well. And that is a reduction. So that what that means is again, manganese four is the oxidized version. It means that something in the chemistry of the brine is transmitting electrons to the manganese and reducing it. It's making it come manganese three or manganese two. Then when we put it in the acid, we see it recovers back to, to manganese four. Well, that makes sense. And the reason it makes sense is because manganese three and manganese two are way more soluble. They go back into solution way more easily than manganese four. And that's exactly why you recall a few slides ago, that's why we saw that relatively high manganese concentration in this lithium concentrate in the acid. So what this means is every time you do this, you're burning up some of your manganese by reducing it, it goes back into the acid and you're losing again, that manganese every single cycle. It's being, this is called the process of reductive dissolution in geochemistry, and it's problematic. We wanna min minimize this. What you see in the green line here is a synthetic brine, right? No organics, and it just is not happening there. The, the sorbent is super stable there, and that's the one where we were getting well under a 1% loss, okay? Um, yeah, so showing you the results here again with sorbent loss, and we see again with the example we were talking about, there's your 9% loss in the real fluid, in the synthetic fluid, you know, less than a percent. So our proposed mechanism, if you look into the literature for soils, for example, there's a lot of literature about how aromatic substances, humic and fulvic acids, so these organic molecules readily reduce manganese. So you can imagine here, again, here's, the, I'm calling it flow backwater here, but here's the brine in which the manganese material is placed. And this is the lithium loading step, right? So it's sitting in the brine, there's lithium in the brine, it goes into the spot, into the ion exchange site in the mineral, and in this case, a proton is kicked out. At the same time, we've got these organic molecules, right? A ton of them, because this is a hydrocarbon, uh, uh, a brine that's been in contact with hydrocarbons across a wide spectrum of chemistries. So something in this brine, some of these organic molecules are able to reduce the manganese. So again, there's electron donation, say two electrons, which reduces this manganese four, to manganese two. 
and it may very well stay associated with the structure at that point. But once we kick this brine off, the lithium voided brine, we're going to throw it away, right? And we take this same material and we put it into the acid, that manganese too in those conditions becomes more soluble because the pH has gone down, it's more acidic. And that's why, again, the manganese is in solution and that's why we see the manganese spike when we're doing this desorption step. And that's the same step, right? Where lithium is being kicked back out into solution. Um, so this is the problem in a nutshell. And this is what in at least the manganese-based sorbents people are trying to deal with to make this process economic. So yeah, I mean, the first point's obviously we said it many times, but at nine, 10% sorbent loss cycle, even really two, 3%, that's not going to stand up for the 100 to 150 cycles that we need. So one um, easy solution here would be to pre-treat the brines. And this has been talked about a lot. So what you could do is do some sort of uh, process before the brine even sees uh, the, the lithium, the DLE material to remove the organics or at least knock them down to much lower concentrations. And of course, that's going to limit uh, both the coating, the physical coating of the sorbent that we talked about, but presumably it's also going to reduce the reductive dissolution, right? The, the reduction of manganese four to manganese two, and then it's loss in the acid step. In terms of organic, um, you know, we thought very much about like, now let's explore the uh, organic geochemistry of the brines and try to nail down which compounds are actually responsible for reducing manganese. I mean, that's scientifically inter interesting, but from a industry standpoint, it's kind of like, um, who cares? It's probably a class of compounds, right? So probably from an applied sense or from an engineering perspective, what you want to do is some sort of a chemical oxidation step. So peroxide comes to mind with UV. I talked actually yesterday with a colleague in Korea about this. It would work quite well to get rid of the organics. Chlorine is another option, although chloride can be a bit difficult to deal with. Filtration, there's some filtration done, at least microfiltration done on site at oil and gas operations. You could think, depending on cost, about implementing ultra nanofiltration to remove these molecules. We did a bit of nanofiltration. It did help, um, but it seems like there's very small molecules that make it through the nano-sized membranes and still cause this phenomenon. Um, and the other one that we're working on now, um, both with E3 Metals, we have a collaboration with them down in Calgary, and also through the Future Energy Systems Program here at Alberta, is coating the sorbent itself. So again, we have these nanoparticles that are made of manganese. What we can do is put a thin micron or nanometer scale veneer of another material on the surface. So we're working on zirconium, it ends up. This material ends up being porous enough to still let lithium and protons in, um, but it would protect the outside of the mineral from the reductive dissolution, right? The, the reduction of manganese. It does, of course, when you put a barrier on something, it's going to reduce the either the amount of lithium that can be taken up by the material or how fast the lithium is taken up. But the question is whether this is a worthwhile exchange, right? We lose a little bit in the rate of recovery or the extent of recovery, but the mineral lasts longer, the synthetic mineral lasts longer. And that's really the point of this, uh, again, this project that we have going. And what I didn't talk about at all is that uh, H2S, so the uh, hydrogen sulfide or the dissolved sulfide that's found in a lot of brines, uh, many brines are sour here in Alberta, this does exactly the same thing. So I won't repeat myself on that, but it very readily reduces manganese 4 to manganese 3 and 2. And the same thing, when the, when the solid sees the acid, you dissolve your sorbent every single cycle. So I, hopefully this helps you on some of the problems we're facing. I think those are some of the big ones. And on the technology side, this is what it really comes down to. Will this process work at a commercial scale? Because we're not just playing a scientific game where you know, we could imagine there's exotic chemicals or expensive processes that would make, it wouldn't be very difficult to make this work in terms of the sorbent durability perhaps, but we have to do it in a way that's also economic, right? We can't be thinking about very exotic and expensive reagents when we design these materials. And that then um, plays into scaling up a reliable material to a prototype, to a pilot scale out in the field, and ultimately, hopefully, a commercial plant here in Alberta. So just quickly then, how am I doing? Good. Um, so I just wanted to give an example. So assume we have a petrobrine production of 10,000 cubic meters per day. So that's a lot of water, but you could get that on one site, perhaps, if you drilled some wells. Um, you could also get that if you look at water hubs, say in uh, West Central Alberta or even up in BC. Um, perhaps you have to put together a few water hubs. And I'll assume this is a relatively high concentration, but assume that I could find brine that delivers reliably 80 ppm lithium. So from this, if you did the DLE process, you'd be looking at producing uh, 1,500 tons of lithium product, again, lithium carbonate equivalent per year. 
That's not a lot. Um, really, people in the industry don't talk. Anything below 1,000 wouldn't even be talked about. This is modest. So it might be that you need several of these sites to make an economic process. But the point is, um, at the current lithium price, uh, which is quite high, it's well over 20,000, I think approaching 30,000. And again, it's all over the place. So in economic analyses, you often see prices closer to 15 or 17,000. But the point is, you might be looking at around $25 million worth of lithium. Now, looking at preliminary analysis that are published and ones that I've been involved with, you know, you might be looking at a profit of 10, 20, maybe even 30%, depending on the site. So if you're delivering back to the operator, uh, you know, a profit that might be in the five, six, seven million dollar range, um, just for borrowing the brine, one could argue that this is a pretty nice offset to the water cost. Keeping in mind that the water transportation, storage, and disposal part of the oil and gas industry is a very expensive part of it, right? So you're not going to cover all of those costs, but it could be a really nice offset to the on-site costs. So just one example of the existing infrastructure example. I was asked to say just some opportunities here in perhaps Edmonton, Calgary, and Alberta. Um, and a lot of people have commented on, on this, but I just wanted to throw them out there. Um, Economic extent, extent, uh, incentives would help, particularly for um, mining and technology companies that are in the lithium space here in the province, even help with things like accessing spaces. A lot of companies are scaling up and moving to bigger facilities. Support and access to qualified personnel. Um, happily here in Alberta, we have a lot of a really strong workforce in the oil and gas uh, industry that have their highly skilled workers, and they can really dovetail into this industry, perhaps with very minimal training. Um, Support for oil and gas operators, right? This is a new, uh, they have the assets. It's a new thing for them to get into. And um, there's value in the lithium brines, my example in the previous slide. Um, so support for them to link up with junior miners and technology companies would be helpful. Uh, educational opportunities, hopefully this is one um, for the public and then incentives for technical training. And a lot of the companies I've talked to and people I've talked to really wonder if we can you know, kind of stop being just a resource provider. Um, you know, a lot of people look at Canada as like the source of the raw materials and we ship them off and they're made into bigger and better things upgraded in other jurisdictions like the US. And the question here is, can we do that here? Can we produce the lithium grade salts here? That's the first step. Okay, can we have an electrolysis plant, you know, that, that makes lithium hydroxide? Or could we even have our own batteries market? And certainly there are battery companies. There's some in Calgary, um, there's some on Ontario, some out in Vancouver that are relatively small. But what I mean is, can we have a really serious large battery market here in terms of production of batteries and shipping, exporting batteries? And that's a pretty exciting possibility, I think. So I wanted to thank um, the funding sources, which I won't read off here, just uh, I've talked about most of them already. Um, the real people who did this work are first uh, Salman Safari, who's my first postdoc on this project. Um, and again, he's moved off to Resian Technologies, the company that we co-founded. Um, he helped me supervise Adam Sipe, who did most of the actual the research part that you saw today. That was his project. Uh, Adam's out with E1 Mali in, uh, near Vancouver. And then two new students. So uh, Dr. Ashkan Zolfakari, he's the new postdoc on the project. And Karthik Shivakumar started as the, uh, the new doc, uh, PhD student. And with that, I'll, again, thank you all. And if there's, uh, Fred thinks there's time, I'd be happy to, to do some questions. Wow. Well, thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, super interesting. Uh, there is time for questions, and uh, if you're if you're up for it, I'll I'll read a few of them out to you. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so Peter Flynn asks, "What's the lithium concentration in the ocean, and how does that compare to Alberta brine?" Yeah, people have talked about um, lithium extraction from the ocean, so it's very low. It's orders of magnitude less. Um, the one place I reviewed a grant in Saudi Arabia, and there was an idea there that because they have obviously very abundant solar resources and there's uh, pretty selective technologies in the grant that I reviewed in terms of recovering lithium, that perhaps an economic industry could be made out of it in a very, well, and there's also a lot of subsidies in Saudi Arabia because it's a wealthy country, but perhaps in a market like that, you could think about going to production of lithium. But again, given that the concentrations are orders of magnitude less than, than is even found in um, petroleum brines, the, it's, not a, it's not on the top of the list of potential targets. Although there is a lot of it. <laughs> Although there is a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Greg asks, what are the reasons the oil field fluids have hurdles with membrane extraction? Is it the hydrocarbon content? Yeah, that's one thing. So hydrocarbons uh, readily foul the membranes. Um, and the other issue there is simply that 
membranes are expensive to produce and, and replace. So I know people, I, I'm sure there's people out there that maybe would argue with me on this. And I know there's a lot of people working on membranes to reduce their costs, but keep in mind, we've got to move. Um, this is not a small scale operation. We're moving 10,000 to perhaps here in Alberta, 100,000 cubic meters of water per day. Um, that's a lot of membranes to produce, maintain and replace. And so this is why in terms of economics, that's why these direct lithium extraction, solid phase materials uh, become preferred. So I'm gonna insert a question here um, on scalability. So, so you would say uh, it would be much easier to scale up uh, direct extraction using um, these manganese, manganese oxides. How, how, where do you source those? Are, are they available in quantity? Normally, yeah, you'd, uh, well, okay, the first thing to say is that chemical companies, I've talked to a few big ones in the world, and co chemical companies are actively looking at getting into the business of manufacturing, not only the manganese ones, but these sorts of ion exchange DLE materials uh, to become providers for junior miners out in the field. Um, but right now, in the absence of that, yeah, you need to basically have a sorbent chemistry that you think works, and then you would need to purchase the materials, the raw materials, and have a, uh, well, you need a large furnace, basically, you need to calcine the sorbent. So you, you would need to do that at the industrial scale and do quality control. And so uh, this is another, you know, you're talking about producing tons of this material. Exactly. Yeah. And that's also something that, uh, that I didn't mention, but you're right, it is something that needs to be considered. So uh, and I see a question from Carl that's uh, sort of adjacent to this. He says, yes, are, are there other cations besides manganese that can be used to extract lithium uh, or are all DLE technologies variants with manganese? They're not, yeah. So there's literature out there on titanium and the reason titanium is not terribly expensive. So that's one that's out there. And then um, other ones have been tested. So antimony comes to mind, um, but yeah. Uh, we want to, um, test more of these outside. In fact, we have tested mm -hmm. other, well, yeah, other cations that are still, they're still oxide materials and they, um, they're ion exchange materials. But I will say if it's very clear out in the patents that have been published and even press releases in some cases that a lot of people are using manganese-based sorbents um, because they're just so highly selective, but they do come with this manganese loss problem because manganese is redox active. So something we have right. to do. So, so with regard to the manganese loss, uh, there's a question from Kay. Can you preferentially reoxidize um, before the acid protonation step? That is a good question. Um, I, I'm, I, we haven't tested that. I mean, I think it would be tough because you, the, the issue there is that you synthesize the solid phase material under very specific conditions. So what I mean is that just the simple act of reoxidizing the manganese doesn't mean that it's going to um, go back onto the sorbent or be in the sorbent. It's not going to have the same uh, uh, crystal structure perhaps as um, the initial phase that you precipitated under, you know, kind of specialized conditions. So something worth, it's actually something that's worth looking at. Um, but I guess, not, yeah, I'm not entirely sure on that one. You. Yeah, you, you could, I'm, I'm not thinking of our data. I think we have tried that step actually, and it might work, but there's something, the cost of the reagents in that step is also, uh, sure. you know, it's another cost in terms of reagents, yeah. but it could yeah. be prohibitive. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you, you pay for oxygen or you pay for lost manganese and, <laughs> or maybe you find a way to prevent it. And actually with regard to that, um, Michael asks, would extracting the water from the bottom of an aquifer, i.e. away from the oil water, interface decrease, oh, this is more uh, decrease the need to treat with surfactant. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if that directly speaks to the manganese loss, but um, yeah, <laughs> uh, since, since the, the hydrocarbon is implicated in the reduction of the manganese, may, maybe that would also touch on the question of, um, of manganese loss. Yeah, this is a game you can play. Um, obviously, the infrastructure that's in place has been targeted to be in the, you know, the hydrocarbon rich part of the formation. So they're, you know, but um, certainly, I mean, keep in mind, drilling a well at that depth is going to be millions of dollars. But 
Um, this is part of the reason I think that some of the operators are looking at drilling their own wells, because you can get these brines that essentially have little to no hydrocarbons in them to start with, and, and you avoid that problem, right? So yeah. I, the answer, I think, is yes. So uh, also on the hydrocarbon side, uh, Kin asks, uh, would using a source of water without hydrocarbons be a better water for lithium recovery? This would obviously only apply to, to wells that aren't connected with the oil and gas industry. But I mean, is, is the, I guess another way to ask the question is, um, would avoiding the hydrocarbon problem make up for the cost of actually drilling a new well? Some people think so, yeah. So, I mean, these are wells that are targeted solely at the, you know, at recovering lithium from brines and, and not worried about the petroleum hydrocarbon problem. So yeah. the issue here, I'll be very frank, um, which I didn't say in the talk, the, again, we're looking at resources here in Alberta that are more or less between 50 and 100 parts per million lithium. On face, uh, if you had the choice of the whole world, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use these brines. I mean, there's a lot of them. That's the good thing. So the resource is vast. Um, but if you look in, for example, I talked to a colleague in Wyoming two hours ago, they have brines there that are 400 ppm lithium, right? I mean, that's the top. And you look at Arkansas where there's a company standard lithium working there. Their brines are between 100 and up to 160 up to, I think around 400 ppm as well. Um, so there, you know, in terms of, instead of, you know, moving the 100,000 cubic meters of water per day, you're moving 30 or 40,000 cubic meters of water per day to produce the same amount of lithium. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so you, you can target, I guess back to the question, you can target brines, you can target ones that don't have H2S, you can target ones that don't have organics. And admittedly, they're a lot easier to work with. So I think the point I wanted to make also in terms of Alberta, I don't wanna get depressed on the industry here because I think it's, it's promising and it's, it's exciting, right. but there should also be a space for technology providers as well. Because you could imagine a technology company in Calgary, a technology company in Alberta, uh, in Edmonton, that they are providing services outside of Alberta and still the, the trained workforce is, is here in the province. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, totally get that. So. Um... Uh, Jack asks, do you, do you think that further focused exploration in Canada could result in discovering more sources of lithium in any form? And, and that's actually, yeah, a question I had is, is what do you even look for if you're trying to find a, a rich deposit of lithium? Yeah, so on the Petrobrine space, the answer is yes. So we've done a huge survey of all the wells in North America as part of a separate project. So we have a database of, I think it's between 2.5 and 3 million wells. And the issue in those data, when you start putting a bunch of databases together, that is that lithium is very rarely reported. Yeah. Um, so there is a project being led right now by BC Geoscience. I'm on one of the committees there. And they're um, looking at getting access to oil and gas wells solely for measuring, well, lithium, but also rare earth elements and other potentially valuable metals. And then yeah, on the solid rock exploration side, there's two um, mines that are moving along, one in Quebec, one in Ontario for lithium here in Canada. There's actually some granitic pegmatites in the northeast part of Alberta. Um, I don't know whether they're economic or not, but certainly there could be other places for hard rock mines. Okay, uh, uh, do we have time for a couple more questions? Don, are we okay? Well, we're at 12.53. I would say, depending on the length of the answer, one to two more. Okay, all and right. Just a note to everyone that the unanswered questions will be addressed. Uh, Daniel will be able to um, respond to them after the webinar. And right. only the recorded um, uh, video of this webinar will be available after the talk. Yeah, and I, and I just want to say there's a ton of questions and I'm only scratching yeah. the surface. So uh, apologies to those who, whose questions I don't get to. So Kevin asks, I noted that potassium content in brine is something like 200 milligrams per liter. Is that the case with the Fox Creek brines? If so, could you co-locate a potassium recovery circuit for another revenue stream? You could think about it. It's definitely worth quantifying, but you know, it ends up that things like um, certainly bromine would be an example, potentially cobalt. There's more economic value in there. And the other thing to say, so yeah, I mean, it's worth quantifying because there could be a day when that's valuable, but you're also competing with, you know, the potash mines, for example, in Saskatchewan and, you know, the economics there in terms of cost of recovery is a lot lower. So I guess I would say that is my answer. Right.
right. So, so that's the low hanging fruit. Uh, and until that's depleted, I, it probably wouldn't make sense. Also, I don't know what kind of um, potassium recovery process would be applicable to this brine. I don't know if there are sorbents that are potassium specific. Um, okay, uh, maybe one last very quick question from Michael. What is the volume of water after, after treatment, i.e. the concentrate versus the original volume extracted from the subsurface? Yeah, you. Um, it, it can vary. So you've got to kind of optimize the sorbent to acid ratio. But again, if you're going from, say, 50 parts per million in the brine to, say, 1,000 in the concentrate or 1,500, then you're looking at a concentration factor of 20 to 30, right? And you may be able to push that up around 50. So it is, you know, the volume is quite a bit less. So in the you're pushing a lot of water through the plant, the 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 cubes per day. But then you're dealing with far smaller volumes of uh, acid when you have the concentrate and post-processing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think I'd better wrap it up. Um, so I want to, first of all, thank you, Dan, for a super presentation. And some of the, the Q&A were just comments about how clear it was and uh, wishing you good luck. Um, so I also want to thank everyone who was able to join us today. Um, and just let you know that our next science talks will be in January, so we're, we're not going to hold one in December, um, but we will share information in December regarding the next one in January. So uh, after the webinar, you'll get an email that'll include uh, more ways to connect, opportunities for how you can support research, uh, programs such as this one, and additional resources, and of course also very importantly, a way for you to share your feedback with us. So with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, sign off and, and just, um, again, thank everybody and uh, ask you to please take care of yourselves and stay in touch with us.